Hello, hello everybody. Uh, today we're gonna talk about the screen of consciousness and how it emerges. Um, this is a very tricky question. Well, first of all, I wanna advertise the quality of the day, which is my SoundCloud, where I've been making QRI songs about, you know, classic topics like the tyranny of the intentional object, how to align DMT entities, reprogramming predators, the universal plot. Why is there something rather than nothing? Now in <laughs> as pop classics or space rock or uh, <laughs> um, death metal. Yeah, there's a there's a good style. I'll, I'll put a link in the description. Um, maybe a breakthrough in how to communicate these ideas, you know, <laughs> only time will tell. Okay, so the screen of consciousness, it's a different problem than the boundary problem of consciousness. The boundary problem is, you know, if we're all one gigantic field of consciousness, why am I here? Why are you there? Why is it that I don't have access to what I will be eating for, you know, lunch tomorrow? I don't have direct epistemic access to it. How come we have these divisions, right? And these divisions um, are individual experiences and, and they're separate. You know, the information is not uh, actually, you know, passing through between these experiences. They're kind of, you know, in some sense, frozen in space time in their coordinates. Uh, of the of the continuum as it were um okay so that's the boundary problem and, and the way we solve it at qri is with essentially topological segmentation you know we, we actually think the field lines in some circumstances can loop around trap energy behave as units be useful for natural selection in other words have causal effects and be crisp you know that sort of solution satisfies a lot of desirable constraints uh, that such a theory would require um now a related but much more specific problem is how do you get a screen of consciousness? I mean, this is the about the representational content of the experience. How come we found ourselves as kind of like little characters inside a theater, you know? Um, I don't usually like to actually describe it in this way, even though it's to a first approximation really accurate. Uh, Stephen Nehar emphasizes we live in some kind of diorama. Well, actually, we are a kind of diorama <laughs> where some elements of the diorama have a special status, which are like representations of self or self models. But, you know, ontologically, there's a good case to be made that you're the entire simulation. Um, Daniel Dennett kind of poisoned the well here to an extent because he uh, tried to dismantle uh, the notion of the Cartesian theater so much that people don't want to put up a fight and and usually give up and say like, well, but hasn't the Cartesian theater been debunked by somebody like Daniel Dennett? And the answer is no. I mean, the multi-draft theory of consciousness is thought provoking and very significant when it comes to accounting for our own introspective deficits where we think, you know, we should have complete and direct access to our experience. However, you know, the geometry of experience isn't challenged by that. I mean, th there is a sense in which you do experience kind of a projective Euclidean uh, space in front of you, and that organizes all of your experience. And yes, it's not as continuous and instantaneously presented, you know, as we might intuitively believe. There are patches uh, that are missing, you know, <laughs> and there's a lot of information that when it's, you know, absent, the fact that it's absent is not part of a representation. It's not, in, you know, explicitly represented. Um, all of that is true. Still though, you know, introspectively, quite obviously, there is a space where, yeah, waves of activation can travel and that's computationally significant and that can be shown in a whole number of ways. But, you know, this is a very strange state of affairs because, you know, physics and science will say that reality is centerless, right? Like there's no privileged point of view. You know, a lot of what say like special relativity is all about is to try to, you know, make sense of a world with uh, different uh, movements and, and, uh, and, and dynamics with no absolute frame of reference. Um, so uh, how is it that out of a, f you know, frame of reference less universe you get 
this feeling of being an individual character inside a theater, which seems some kind of like absolute frame of reference that is encompassing, you know, a lot of information, a lot of matter potentially, or a very large region of the field, is a strange situation, right? Like, in fact, if you were to solve the boundary problem with something like quantum coherence or like, you know, some fundamental aspect of physics that makes everything, you know, ontologically united uh, before it gets, you know, bifurcated or segmented out into, into, into mind dust or anything like that, you know, by virtue of, 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 of the nature of, of these sort of like ontologically unified objects, in general, you would expect it to maybe feel like a soup of extremely integrated information as opposed to, you know, something geometrically structured that seems to be experienced from a specific point of view, right? Like this is an odd situation. It, it makes a lot of evolutionary sense, right? Like it's has good, you know, representational fidelity and it's, it's a, an accurate way in a sense of representing the world for functional purposes, but it's not you know, <laughs> ontologically clear how, you know, the brain is pulling off this trick. And it gets more tricky once you consider the fact that this is not always the case. It, you know, on uh, psychedelics, there is this phenomenon we call point of view fragmentation, where it qu very much literally feels like your visual field gets fragmented into various competing clusters of coherence. And each of those clusters of coherence has a different projective point at infinity. And, you know, in fact, whether two competing clusters of coherence become part of the same kind of projective cluster, where part of the world simulation looks like you're perceiving it from the same point of view, that requires the alignment of the points of infinity in those pockets of your visual field. Uh, and so actually there's also point of view annealing where, you know, the points at infinity, the projective points, start to essentially be shared and propagated <laughs> within the regions of the field until you actually have, like, let's say, a global shared point of view for the entirety of your visual field with one point at infinity to which you're looking at. Um, in other words, there are ways of fragmenting and then reuniting these points of view in a way that seems to follow, you know, some, you know, mathematics of projective geometry logic. Um, and, you know, in, in high doses of ketamine, for example, I could argue that you actually experience a complete, you know, defragmentation of, of uh, the coherence of the screen of consciousness, where essentially kind of like every point in your experiences has a different perspective on what the whole thing looks like. Um, and there's just no consensus at all about what type of experience you're having. Yeah, that's an extremely confusing state of consciousness, but very important as a, as a case study. That, yeah, no, the, the screen of consciousness is not necessarily, <laughs> you know, an emergent effect out of like brain dynamics. There's many other possible geometries. And it's not just as, you know, in terms of modifying the parameters of the projective uh, representation, but much more radical. You know, things like just no point of view or like no projective point at infinity or just an ageometric state where like it doesn't seem to be the case that points are related by distances. So there's so many corner cases and, and, and counter examples to kind of like any universalizing um, claim made in this space. OK, so <laughs> this is the problem. I think the solution will look kind of unexpected and to some extent much more complex than we might imagine. Of course, I do very much prefer solutions uh, that are as simple as possible. Um, you know, one or two principles, like for example, the principle of least action or something like path integrals on uh, complex amplitudes. Simple principles that maybe are hard to calculate, but then give you everything, you know, the whole, the, the behavior of the entire system. That is the ideal. Um, but you know, the brain is very specific and highly evolved. Um, and, and we can imagine that even though consciousness does have these universal, you know, principles that explain its behavior, um, there will be a certain degree of specificity that will be necessary to account for, you know, like specific animal, you know, evolved experiences. Here's what I think might be going on. And, and, you know, this is obviously quite complex. So chances are I'm either overfeeding or I'm like, you know, 
just feel, feeding poorly, you know, using a, a model that is inadequate. But it is a sort of thing that I think will be clarifying at some point. So I essentially think that attention has four entirely different uh, systems um, and that, you know, the emergent, you know, Euclidean geometry of our experience is a careful balancing between those four systems. Um, I'll just go through them very quickly in future videos and write-ups. I'll dive much more deeply. Um, you know, the first kind of attentional system is competing clusters of coherence. And, you know, I think this accounts for maybe between three and seven of our working memory slots or something like that on any given point in time. And this is kind of like the structural scaffold of the scene that you're experiencing where, you know, there's maybe clusters of objects and events like, oh, there's a mountain there, there's my friend is over here, there's a tree over there. The very broad outline of kind of like the scene, each of those very big clusters will be represented with essentially a set of, uh, you know, interlocking sensations that have their own eigenmodes, their own resonant modes. And the actual feel, you know, the, the quality of the whole experience will be a function, you know, not only of their position and their shapes, but also the degree to which they're not actually synchronized. And, you know, in what way they're out of phase. Because if you do synchronize these underlying kind of in, internal representations um, and get them to be globally coherent, well, then actually space and time may disappear. Uh, in other words, the precise timing and the differences in the frequencies between these objects is in some sense uh, load-bearing to generate phenomenal space-time. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, this touches upon, yeah, this overall idea that, like, you can't know an experience fully in every way because you can either put more kind of, like, points on, you know, grasping its spatial properties versus its temporal or frequency domain properties. Here is, is like that. I mean, like, if you want to experience all of these clusters perfectly crisply, you will need to synchronize them and kind of see them as a gestalt. But if you do that, then you're going to be losing the time element of that scene, which has a lot of information from, you know, vibes to the passage of time to the scale and the size of, of the scene. All of that will be lost. So that's number one. <laughs> number two is we have an attentional system that I think is very top down and it functions a, as a kind of like laser pointer. And the first approximation is kind of like a works as a raster plot on our experience, kind of like trrr, filling in the details um, in a very systematic but very fast way. And this is a, a you know putting together features of experience and binding them. Um, and resolving uh, inconsistencies in the scene. Um, and a lot of people may actually identify with this type of attention and maybe kind of like being the witness is related to focusing on this type of attention, but it's just one of, you know, a number of them. Then the, the third type is um, feeling in, which is where um, whenever you find a boundary in your field, um, the boundary will emit waves <laughs> that essentially fill in the detail of whatever space is bounded. Um, this is how colors work. I mean, when you hold an orange, um, it gets painted and it gets painted kind of from the outside in and it, the color bounces several times and it stabilizes. And it's a balance of forces. And the reason why, you know, the orange is not exploding and, you know, spreading to the rest of your visual field is because there's a container. And then there's also the color from the outside that is pushing in. <laughs> I know this sounds very crazy, but um, whether meditation or psychedelics, there are corner cases with, for example, you may experience an orange um, uh, having a little bit of a break or lose kind of like connection in its uh, boundary. And when that happens, then the color may actually escape and spread over and, you know, kind of completely turn the color of your entire visual field into whatever that was. Um, yeah, this is also, yeah, being studied by psychophysics and uh, people like Grosberg and uh, Stephen Lehar that, yeah, your everything is trying to expand in your visual field 
um, and getting filled in all the time. And there's a, it's essentially there's almost kind of like a positive pressure of like color and these qualities all the time, but we are fish swimming in water and so we don't notice it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's there and it's like part of what makes the world simulation work. Um, and then, yeah, the fourth type is kind of what I call like a blanketing operation and it's very fast as well, very holistic. But it's, it's kind of this ability that our field has to use internal boundaries to essentially pack it or package and group together clusters of coherence. And when you group them together, as if like you're, you know, subsetting them with, with blankets, essentially, uh, you're going to increase the coupling constant. Uh, in, in other words, everything within the internal boundary will be interacting more intensely and will be more likely to synchronize. Uh, and enter into consonants. And so, you know, you're constantly kind of like trying to prove the valence of your experience by, you know, packaging elements of it, separating, modularizing, and then also increasing the, you know, coupling constant between some of those key subsets. Okay, so I think like the 3D Euclidean space that we inhabit is constructed second after second by the very careful interleaving balance between these four attentional systems that are constantly reifying and reconstructing our reality. And so it's very fast and, and extremely structured and that's why we don't notice it and it's so hard to explain. I mean, it's pre-verbal, um, but I think it is something along those lines and you know something like DMT that sometimes generates 3D you know, hyperbolic geometry and things like that. I think that's the result in this view of a change in the balance between these attentional systems and things such as like the relative speed and tracer effects, like how long do they last? <laughs> and so, yeah, actually DMT, I would say it's um, one of the reasons why I, in some sense can show some kind of super intelligence. Isn't it not because the super intelligence is in the molecule, obviously it's, it's more that it makes these attentional systems interact faster with each other and build more information in, in a way that, yeah, it's not evolutionarily adaptive, but the process of reification of the world simulation ends up with a different geometry because of how fast everything is being put together and, and things are not dissolving <laughs> very quickly. So the attractors are like, yeah, these crazy hyperbolic, you know, kale worlds and, and, uh, <laughs> and clown worlds and, and Rubik's cubes worlds and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we deeply understand uh, how the attentional systems are put together, we will be able to edit our experience and in principle generate any emergent geometry we want, which is an interesting promise. Uh, so with that, <laughs> infinite bliss, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Very spontaneous, but hopefully, hopefully worth it. <laughs>